but also put the person on when other somebody else yeah, is speaking. So, so if we need to go to the bathroom, or something. we're live. I'm sorry, but we're live. Okay. That's what, yeah. We can begin. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Sabah al khair, masa al nur, masa al khair. In, uh, in the from the west coast of the United States to the east coast uh, to Palestine. Uh, my name is Rabab Abdul Hadi. I'm uh, the director of the Arab and Muslim Ethnicity and Diaspora Studies program. And I will be co-moderating this panel with my long, long term comrade, brother, uh, co-conspirator, Dr. Sam Anderson uh, from the National Black Education Agenda. And we, before we actually go on to anything, I want to uh, acknowledge that we are meeting. Let me just. Uh, we, the campus of San Francisco State, is. And the San Francisco Peninsula and North Bay are located within the occupied territories of the Ramatush, Olani, and the coastal Miwok who along with the Southern Pomo are organized as the Federated Indians of the Greater Rancheria. Uh, the, the, the event in, uh, in uh, the people in the East Coast are, uh, are sitting on the Klenapi uh, people's land, displaced people's land. And of course, we are uh, many of us who are joining us are joining us from Palestine and uh, from uh, African areas, some of which have been uh, colonized, continue to be colonized, subject to settler colonialism, and some of which have, have are freer. And we will be talking about that. Uh, I wanted to also recognize, before we get into, pass on the uh, man, uh, back to my uh, brother uh, Sam, I wanted to recognize the co-organizers, the co-sponsors, and the people behind the scene. This event is co-organized by the Arab and Muslim Ethnicity and Diaspora Studies, at San Francisco State University, by the Elan Bebrad Foundation, by the National Black Education Agenda, by, and by the People's Forum. Other co-sponsors include the December 12th Movement, the Jewish Voice for Peace in Boston, Muslim Society's Global Perspectives Project at the Queen's University in Canada, Muwatan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights from Birzeit University in Palestine, and the International Cam Campaign to the and Professor Rabab Abdul Hadi. I want to acknowledge the people who have helped with this, uh, the, specifically my graduate student of Ahmed, Lay Khulum, who is also the TA for the classes, and Hidayah, who is also um, uh, an intern with Ahmed. I also want to acknowledge the invaluable work of Salim Shahade, who is a doctoral student at UCLA, who is studying Palestinian students, Palestinian student organizing, and writing their PhD at this point, who also was a student at the MA, MA student in Ahmed studies at San Francisco State University. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge Daisy Diamond, who has designed this beautiful graphic, and others in the 2021 Teaching Palestine series, and Sarah Sills, who designed the series for 2020. Both Sarah and Daisy are volunteer and designers comrades who have been working with us. Uh, the team who organized, conceptualized the event includes uh, speakers who will be with us today, uh, Sinke Brat, uh, Professor Dr. Bill Sales, Dr. Abdul Kalimat, and Dr. Sam Anderson, and myself. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Anderson to speak about why, uh, why did we start the event, why we, uh, for the, the, the 19th of May, and why we moved it, and then I will go back and speak about why we're doing this as open classrooms and Ahmed, and then some of our speakers will be talking about why Black August, uh, what is Black August or and Palestinian August, how this event came about. So let's start. I'm passing it back to you, Brother Sam. Okay, thank you, uh, Sister Rabab, um, and welcome everybody uh, to this uh, historic uh, gathering. Uh, very, very important gathering of uh, activists, both in the African-American community and within the uh, Palestinian uh, diaspora. Um, uh, in, in terms of Black America, there's a long history, as, as you will see, uh, hear from, uh, of, of uh, 
the struggle in solidarity with the Palestinian uh, uh, people. And uh, we felt that uh, Malcolm's birthday, May 19th, would be a good day to commemorate the long solidarity um, between African Americans and Palestinians um, and Malcolm's involvement in that, which you will hear shortly about. Um, and um, we had we had different issues uh, that, that came up that are, are, arose in that on that day. And so the alternative suggestion was we do something in Black August, which is another historic month um, in terms of um, recognizing the long history of resistance and struggle among people of African descent in North America. Uh, Black August um, uh, has, a, has the month ha is, is chock full of historical um, uh, uh, milestones and, and, and important things. So we, we felt that it was important to do that. This after, uh, well, not this afternoon, but today, <laughs> we will hear from uh, uh, activists, uh, longtime activists, and some younger activists dealing with the relationship between uh, the African American liberation struggle and the Palestinian struggle. Um, and we will also uh, see that um, there is a long history between the uh, issues of Islam and, 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 and Black America dating from slavery times to the present. Um, I will not take up much more time. I think it's important that, you know, there are a number of questions that will arise from these short presentations um, that we can um, uh, deal, deal with partially within the question and answer period. But uh, it's my sense that the presentations will present even more uh, enthusiasm to do something like a part two of this to get some 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 clarification uh, going. And and the challenge within with, with, for us is the pandemic, um, and 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 how capitalism um, uh, pimps off of this this reality and 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 exacerbates. The already tight uh, negative tension between the Zionist forces inside and outside the United States and the Palestinian struggle, uh, and 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 that's some of the uh, problems that Sister Rabab has raised um, that we are dealing with and that we 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 need to confront uh, 24/7 in various ways. Uh, without saying anything else further. Um, um, we will go with um, our first presenter, right, uh, Sister Rabab, our first presenter? Uh, actually, I wanted to also just say a couple of uh, things about uh, why, how, why we moved it, add, add more a little bit about why we moved it, or we can speak about this later. But I wanted to also add that this is an honored open classroom, so we are actually having students from our classes joining us and learning. And when we say students, we have students within formally the classroom and students outside of the classroom. And this also we are abiding by the principle of decolonizing the curriculum, of making sure that education is not privatized and it's not limited to people who pay tuition and that we engage with everybody. The pandemic both opened up uh, uh, closed possibilities and opened up other possibilities, including the fact that we would be able to reach out to the world with online discussion, but also, but this is where the Zionists intervened and sought to shut us down. And uh, what happened is that the Ahmed Facebook page was completely shut down by, the, by Facebook uh, as a result of Zionist pressure, and this is why we couldn't actually do it on Malcolm X's uh, birthday, and which was also the anniversary of the passing of uh, our brother Elam Bebrath and Sinka will be speaking about that. But I also wanted to say that we started this particular project last year because it was the 50th anniversary of the 1970 statement in the New York Times published by Black Radicals on Palestine, which, of which um, uh, Sam Anderson was actually co-editor. And we uh, planned several events and we had one last year on May 19th as well. 
and we've had all these events again and again. So this is a continuation of this project that we will come to and we will speak about that. And uh, the last, um, now I'm going to, and oh, and I wanted to just say about uh, the reason we also, we, there is Black August, there is Palestinian August. It's not identified officially as Palestinian August, but in August, uh, it is the anniversary of the uh, fall of the Palestinian refugee camp Tel Zatar uh, in 1976 during the Lebanese Civil War, which was attacked by Lebanese right-wing forces that were aligned with Israel and the United States. Uh, August 29th is the birthday of, uh, Naj is, the, is the day on which Najil Ali, the Palestinian critical cartoonist who created Hamdallah, the figure, uh, died as a result of being shot by the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service in London. He passed away and there were for many years, uh, people were thinking it was actually other Palestinian rivals who killed him, but uh, the Mossad bragged about it and it was found out it was actually the Mossad, which has done this also to Palestinian and other. We will talk about this, about the history of uh, black radicals. And I want to uh, just alert people to the graphic that we have, that I mentioned Daisy had designed. Uh, it, the graphic displays uh, both the, uh, the picture of uh, the martyr George Jackson, who died on August, who was killed on August 21st in his prison cell. It shows the, the Hamdallah, which is the cartoon character by Najil Ali. It shows uh, the uh, images of Malcolm X and Elam Bebrath. It shows the map of Africa. It is in the colors of the Palestinian flag. And it also uh, shows the uh, representation of a mural in the Palestinian refugee camp, the Haitian refugee camp, where the mural was painted on the inside walls because Israel not allow Palestinians to paint on the outside world. So muralists and activists who will go and work with Palestinian artists painted it on the inside. And the mural shows a Palestinian uh, throwing a stone with uh, uh, throwing a stone, which was very much symptomatic of the uh, Intifada, 1987 Intifada of the stone. Uh, people refer to sometimes as the first. We don't say first because there have been many Intifadas. And it also has the poem in Arabic that uh, it was found in George Jackson's prison, Enemy of the Sun, Ya Adu Wa Shams, uh, which was actually written by the Palestinian late poet Samih al Qasim, who himself refused to serve in the Israeli military and actually was imprisoned by Israel. He, he passed away a few years ago. But the poem, but George Jackson took the poem and wrote it in his hand. And when he was killed, when people were looking at his and what was left in his cell, they thought that it was his uh, poetry. And the poetry and many of the archives were preserved by the Freedom Archives. And now the Freedom Archives are doing a lot of campaign about it. There were also colleagues of ours uh, in the Black Studies, uh, Greg Thomas uh, and others who organized big exhibition a couple of years ago uh, with the Palestinian Abu Jihad Museum for Prisoners Affairs at Al-Quds University, in which they call it George Jackson and the Sun. And they, there is a whole discussion about that. But this is why we also thought this is the best time to do it. Also today is the third day of uh, classes opening up at San Francisco State. So now our students are able to join and be part of this open classroom as well as everybody else. So now I turn it back to you, uh, Sam, if you would like to moderate the first round, please. Yes, um, our first presenter is, um, am I right, Brother Sinke? Yes? You're on mute. Brother Sinke Brath of the Alambe Brath. You got, okay. I'd like to say thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to really open up and start just a little bit talking about um, Ilan Bay Brath and his introduction to, you know, most people uh, know my late father, Ilan Bay Brath, as a Pan-Africanist and an internationalist. But um, what they don't know is that he really got his start as an activism with a Muslim brother named Zachary Abdullah. It was night the year was 1948 he was 12 years old 
And Zachary Abdullah had, was teaching a young kid. He had opened up a school in the South Bronx over in Kelly Street. It was called the Shabazz School. Um, now, Zachary Abdullah, under this name, some people may not know him or recognize him, but he was actually a great baritone singer that um, people will be for, familiar with through the play Porgy and Bess. His real name was Les, well, his Christian name was Leslie Scott. And he had uh, converted to Islam at some point and taken the name Zachary Abdullah. And in 1948, when my father was 12, during a time in which um, I think it was Israel and Lebanon, the war had broken out in the Middle East. He started taking kids from that neighborhood and teaching them. Um, it was like a small group, my father, my uncle, Kwame Brathway. Um, and he began teaching them about the country. They would go to, they would dissect things in movies that, you know, unbeknownst to many, Leslie Scott was sort of like, uh, he's a, he was an unsung hero of the area. Um, he played, and initially in the play Porgy and Bess, he played Porgy. Uh, in the movie, um, and because he was the only one who could sing and do some of the things that he was, he was doing. But initially they would not, you know, they, we talk about censorship, you know, with Palestine, but really a part of it is a, it was a larger whole Muslim censorship of any name. When he applied for initially for Porgy and Bess under the name Zachary Abdullah, they wouldn't even hear him. They wouldn't let him sing. They wouldn't let him apply nothing. But when he, when he applied under the name, he was born named Leslie Scott, you know, his Christian name, or, you know, the, they say in New York, your, your government name, <laughs> you know, then they said, oh, okay. They let him, uh, you know, uh, audition and he, he, and he tore it apart. He was, he was great. So he came in and, you know, he was doing that for, you know, he was the most talented, as I said, of everybody there. But little do people know Leslie Scott and Zachary Abdullah are the same person. And Leslie Scott, only reason he didn't um, get the role in Porgy and Bess in the film was because they told him that Sidney Poitier was taller and that they were looking for somebody taller. He still had a role in the film, but he didn't get the role that, which he had in the plays and which he was originally scheduled for. So I just wanted to start out by acknowledging that outside of um, our great cousin, Clenel Wickham, who... Um, was an editor at the Herald newspaper who everybody associates with Ilambe's early first orientation in politics. That there's the, the brother named Zachary Abdullah who was teaching them about the Palestinian cause in 1948 on Kelly Street. Um, he had about eight kids and he was, he was really the unsung hero of the area. And he's also a very talented actor that people either know him by one of those names, but he was, you know, when he, it was the Arthur Godfrey show that he first came on, but again, he had to basically not use his name, Zachary Abdullah and use his name, Leslie Scott to get, we'll say, get some play and to get seen, heard and audition. So um, I want to acknowledge Leslie Scott, AKA Zachary Abdullah and his first taking Ilambe under his, his wing, as well as my uncle Kwame and, and some of the six other young men on Kelly Street in the Bronx and teaching them about what was happening in, in Palestine and, you know, putting them on, setting them on the right path and the right course very early, early on in life. I, I wanted to acknowledge him because people look at what my father had done, Ilambe had done with the Patrice Lumumba Coalition, you know, he was always, uh, you know, they say PLC and PLO were only separated by one letter. And sometimes people would think, why is PLO on here? And I mean, we have still a lot of flyers from over the years for all of the programs. And you see at least quarterly, there would be some voice or some representation from uh the Palestinian cause on, on those flyers, you know, being highlighted, their perspective, you know, so some observers who might know, they might not say, well, how, what does uh, the Palestinian struggle have to do with some of these other issues? And it, it had everything to do with it, you know, and as they became, began to get um, 
understanding of the Patrice Lumumba Coalition as an African internationalist organization, they began to understand the Palestinian cause and why we have to support them and why we um, must steadfast also keep their issue in the, as much in our community and in the press as possible. Because we all know that, you know, the press is, had been, the, the corporate press had been the main persons or entities responsible for the biased coverage. And if you have any doubt about that, if you ever would see this book here, the book is called Elambe Braff's Selected Writings and Essays. It's edited by her boy, but in there, Bernard White, who's the former program manager at WBAI, he, he told the story about how with all of the programs, they what the reason, the cause in 1982, um, why they removed Elambe from Like It Is. And I'm just gonna share a little quick excerpt from the book with what Bernard says. He says in here, um, he was in a meeting with Gil Noble, who was the host of Like It Is and Elambe Breath. Gil was the host of ABC's Like It Is and Elambe was a consultant and graphic artist. Of course, he was doing all of the international guests. He helped to shape the show by providing guests on a variety of topics from around the globe. In 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. The corporate media in its normal knee-jerk fashion supported Israel. We heard nothing at that time from the Lebanese or the Palestinian community. Ilambe and Gil put together a program to give voice to the targets of the massive aerial bombardment. The program was taped on Thursdays to be aired on Sunday. After the taping, Zionist organizations were alerted that the program was going to be aired and they should bombard WABC switchboard with calls protesting the broadcast and calling for the cancellation of Like It Is. Both Gil and Ilambe were called into the office to talk to the CEO of WABC New York and a member of the United States State Department. Yes, the State Department. According to Alambe, the guy from the State Department was interested in his relationship with leaders in the anti-colonial struggles in the Caribbean and on the continent of Africa. He told Ilambe, you have a lot of information on African history, to which Ilambe replied, not nearly as much as you have. But at the end of the meeting, Gil was told he could no longer do programs on international issues and Ilambe could no longer work on international issues with him or as his graphic artist. So that just one of the many hurdles that people have overcome to just bring accurate information about the Palestinian cause and struggle, you know, to uh, people. And so I just wanted to give that little overview of Ilambe Braff, his organization, the Patrice Lum his one of the organizations that he co-founded, the Patrice Lumumba Coalition. And now I'm going to, um, you know, turn it back because I know we press for time and we have other amazing speakers. Uh, uh, speakers. Professor Rabab, uh, I'm ready to turn the mic back over to you. Oh, to thank you so much, Sinke. This was amazing. I mean, once you start talking about uh, Ilambe, Allah Yirhamo, may he rest in peace and power. I mean, I have so many memories. I'm not going to go because if I start talking, I probably need like, <laughs> yeah many many hours and weeks and so on and i keep remembering but uh, i'm going to actually just turn it over to uh, our other young uh, young girl participant uh, ahmed abu Zned, who is uh, the the executive director of the u.s campaign for palestinian rights in washington dc a long 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 time activist co-founder of the dream defenders and i'm going to actually let ahmed speak about uh, where so we actually decided just so people we switched the, the the order we decided to start with the younger people and go over and then and then we're not actually making any statements about age who is older or younger but we're doing uh, maybe three to five minutes at the beginning of opening remarks just so placing people and then we will continue taking as brother sam said uh, we will need many many more discussions every single time we have more to say thank you so much Sinke. And uh, can you please uh, maybe add the, uh, the the title of the book so we can actually okay. share it with our audience? Yeah. So if you can put it in the chat, 
we can actually in the comments okay. in the comments okay. so people can on yeah. our audiences can join and i want to turn it over to ahmed so ahmed it's yours and then afterwards going to be dr abdul kalimat and dr bill sales and then dr rosemary mealy and then uh, sister aisha al adawiya and then uh, sam anderson and uh, me before we go to the second round so Perfect. go ahead ahmed Thank you, Dr. Rabab, Sam, Sinke, uh, and to all the co-organizers and co-sponsors at the event. Um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed learning uh, already, and we just started. And so I, I love when I can come into a space and, and feel like I can impart something upon those attending, but I can also learn, and that is the type of space that you all have put together today. So thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmed Abu Zneid. I was born in East Jerusalem. Palestine, and I had the opportunity to live in East Jerusalem as well as in Al Khalil, uh, aka Hebron, and and obviously that um, experience of uh, growing up under occupation um, left an impact on me. Um, a couple of the main um, unfortunate memories that I hold from childhood are the Ibrahimi Mosque massacre, uh, when a settler from Brooklyn, New York, uh, opened fire in the mosque in the opening morning prayers during the holy month of Ramadan, um, killing 30 Palestinians and injuring over 100. Um, you know, I think that in addition to the checkpoints and the strip searches and uh, the heavily armed forces uh, of the occupation um, being around at every turning point um, definitely leaves a lasting impact on a child. I moved back to the US at age 12 and began to um, have a deeper sense of the inequalities, the injustices, and the systemic abuses that we witness in the United States. Uh, it was very clear to me that uh, Black Americans, Latino Americans, Asian Americans, many different communities had diff uh, different struggles that uh, the U.S. had um, uh, levied upon them. Uh, and of course, you know, our Indigenous Native American um, siblings who experienced uh, of course, uh, a fate very similar to what we've experienced um, as Palestinians. And so I began to see these things and I began to, to uh, assess that the U.S. history they were teaching us in schools just wasn't really adding up. And so fast forward a bit to college, uh, there was a young boy named Martin Lee Anderson who was killed in a juvenile boot camp uh, in Bay County, Florida, about two hours away from where I went to school at Florida State University. And they attempted to cover up the death of Martin Lee Anderson, um, uh, alleging that he died due to complications from sickle cell anemia. But of course, there was, um, you know, some truth that came out about the cover up, and we witnessed a video of guards beating young Martin Lee Anderson to death. Um, we took action, and it was the first time, you know, for me in my life that I was driven to civil disobedience and direct action when myself and 30 other students occupied the governor's office of then Governor Jeb Bush. Um, and we demanded several things be accomplished before we would be willing to leave. And, you know, some of those demands were accomplished and others, of course, we did not accomplish. For instance, we shut down all of those boot camps in the state of Florida, all of those juvenile boot camps. Um, governor Jeb Bush had to meet with the family. Um, he arrested um, many of those involved and, um, and, and charged them. Now, of course, those folks were not found guilty. Uh, of course, the system went from juvenile boot camps to now private residential facilities, AKA private prisons. And so we learned some lessons back in those days about how the system will reinvent itself to continue to oppress. A few years later, young Trayvon Martin was killed. And many of my comrades that I organized with in college um, made the call that we reunite. And that's when we founded the Dream Defenders and we marched from Bethune-Cookman, a historically black college and university in Daytona, Florida. We marched to Sanford, Florida, where young Trayvon Martin was gunned down. And on that march, where we marched for 40 miles in over three days, I was wearing a keffiyeh. And the keffiyeh has obviously been, been such a, a powerful, um, how do I say, proponent, uh, but also uh, subject matter that we identify with, you know, the Palestinian resistance. And so people would ask me questions, you know, what does the scarf mean? And we started to have conversations about state sanctioned violence, um, about oppression, about apartheid, about colonialism. And we started to lay the groundwork 
on that very first march for the delegations that we would leave that we would lead at the Dream Defenders. And basically our goal with the Dream Defenders leading those delegations was that we wanted to re-engage the black radical tradition um, uh, from, from the Dream Defender standpoint. We wanted to re-engage re the black radical traditions, solidarity, historic solidarity with the Palestinian cause and Palestinian liberation. And so we started taking delegates from all over the US uh, from Movement for Black Lives, uh, from the Gathering for Justice, from the Women's March, um, from Ferguson uh, to Palestine so that they could meet with uh, our counterparts on the ground over there, people dedicating their daily lives on the ground in Palestine uh, to struggle and liberation would have the opportunity to sit down with those doing the exact same thing here in the U.S. Um, and and I think the, the, the takeaway for me has been that so many of folks, so many of the folks in this generation, unfortunately think that Dream Defenders and, and Black Lives Matter were a part of a beginning of a trajectory. And so that's why I get so excited about these conversations where we can talk about these historic connections, the historic legacy of our shared solidarity and one day our shared liberation. So I just wanted to get you started briefly with understanding a bit how I came into this work and how Dream Defenders delegations have become a part of this rich tradition. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Rabab or Sam uh, to hand it over to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ahmed. Um, we're going to hear from Brother Abdul uh, Akalimat, who is a longtime uh, revolutionary activist, uh, scholar, um, good organizer um, uh, based in the Chicagoland area. I, I believe he's still there, right? <laughs> still in the Chicagoland area. Um, uh, Brother uh, Abdul Akalimat um, uh, is one of the founders of the uh, African Liberation Support Committee, um, among many other um, organizations, uh, in, uh, in, both in academia as well as in, in the community. And we'll hear from Brother Abdul Akalimat, and then uh, Brother Bill Sales uh, will follow. You're going to unmute. Bottom left. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> First of all, let me express my appreciation for being involved in this uh, program. Uh, the program that we're having today is part of a new development enabling us using cyberspace to have global conversations. So I'm very pleased that we not only have people in the United States, but people who are outside, especially people in Palestine. Welcome to this discussion. I've been an activist, as Sam said, in the, uh, in the Black Liberation Movement and in what we call Black Studies uh, for almost 50 years. I want to just make a couple of points about uh, what happened 50 years ago. Well, first of all, central to our intellectual and political development in this country, particularly African Americans, but really the movement more generally, is the figure of Malcolm X. Uh, who uh, enabled us to move beyond the civil rights movement, beyond the demand for inclusion into the United States mainstream society to the concept of black liberation that not only represented the fundamental demand for freedom for African-Americans, but it also represented a critique and a fundamental challenge to the nature of the American society in general and its policies throughout the world. Malcolm wrote a very important essay. We will get back to discussing Malcolm in more detail later, but he wrote a very important essay in 1964 called Zionist Logic. Well, this is an important way in which he critiqued Zionism as a fundamental uh, global policy of repression, and, and it re represented a very important uh, aspect of his thinking. Malcolm was assassinated the next year Following that, in 1966, we developed the concept of black power. Black power really was the popular slogan in the social movements of the African-American people uh, 
following on Malcolm's lead. So black power became the important way in which the African-American community began to talk about self-determination and national liberation. This of course enabled us to then connect immediately with the African liberation struggles so that by 1972, uh, the formation of the African Liberation Day Coordinating Committee initiated a massive demonstration in Washington DC and in San Francisco and a couple of other places to support African liberation. And after that one demonstration, the African Liberation Support Committee was founded. So the African Liberation Support Committee was an important initiative because it enabled us to move from a critique of racism to a critique of imperialism. And this led us to understand national oppression, not just in Southern Africa and not just in the United States, but in Palestine as well. So that by, in my own case, by 1975, I was director of the African American Studies Program at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, in the south of the United States. And we had a number of conferences. And one of the conferences we had was entitled The World Crisis and the Middle East. And just to give you a flavor of what we were thinking, I want to read the conference call to this conference, World Crisis and the Middle East. 1975. We call all people who are for human rights, national liberation, and freedom to a conference on the world crisis and the Middle East. Our concern is based on the current exploitation and oppression of the masses of people in the Middle East. We stand totally opposed to the role of imperialism, sub-imperialism, and Zionism in all forms, especially the striving for hegemony by Israel. We believe that countries want independence, nations want liberation, and people want revolution. Therefore, this conference is dedicated to the masses of people in the Middle East, especially the masses of dispossessed people of Palestine. This conference comes near the proletarian holiday May Day we feel that this is fitting, for May Day symbolizes proletarian internationalism. We call all people who support human rights, national liberation, and freedom to come together at this conference and intensify the fight against exploitation and oppression. Further the struggle through study, long live the forces of national liberation, long live proletarian internationalism, long live Palestine. I think this gives you a flavor of what the most progressive wing of the Black Liberation Movement was thinking in 1975. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Abdul. Um, that was a, a great teaser. I'm, I'm certain that people would like to hear more uh, and have questions on that. That, that it's a very important moment in our history. Um, uh, next is uh, Brother Bill Sales, uh, another long-term, long-time activist um, coming out of the Black Liberation Movement in New York City and Harlem, um, and also out of the Black Studies programs, uh, as well as the African Liberation Support Committee, uh, Black New York Action Committee, a number of things um, in, in, his, in his resume uh, revolution, of revolution, revolutionary organizing. Um, so Brother Bill um, will be next. Welcome. Thank you, Sam. Just several things I'd like to do uh, briefly uh, is to preface Malcolm's emergence as an advocate of Black Palestinian solidarity by looking at the antecedents in his life, which put him in the position to play that important catalytic role. August is also the birthday month of Marcus Garvey. Garvey created the largest organization 
of people of African descent the world has ever seen. He created this organization. It's called the Universal Negro Improvement Organ Association, the African Communities League. He created this in 1914 at the onset of World War I. <clears throat> Garvey, as a very young man, traveled throughout the Caribbean and Central America organizing black workers. In the first decade of the 20th century also went to London and fell under the influence of uh, Egyptian Sudanese intellectual named Deuce Muhammad Ali. Ali was a pan-African and pan-Arab nationalist and a staunch anti-imperialist. He was the founder of the African Times and Orient Review. Garvey apprenticed at that newspaper, producing several articles at the time and absorbing a whole lot of what was to be his later synthesis that black people should be committed to racial unity on a worldwide basis and to the absolute liberation of Africa from European imperialist control. Deuce Muhammad Ali, after his newspaper was banned in England, immigrated to the United States and joined Garvey and became one of the editors of Garvey's newspaper, The Black World. He later on became a fixture in Hong for many decades but ultimately spent the rest of his life in Nigeria as an important pan-African nationalist figure in that country. Now, the Garvey movement made space because of the influence of Deuce Muhammad Ali and other people sympathetic to Arab nationalism. It made space in its organization for those African-Americans who had rejected a Christian-based identity and thought of themselves in an extension of the Arab world. This was no way a majority, but their presence in the Garvey movement was to become important. Here we're talking about people like Noble Drew Ali and Elijah Muhammad, who saw their racial identity as much Arabic as African. This has some basis, in fact, since so many of the slaves who were brought into the Western Hemisphere were from areas of Africa where Islamic influence was quite important. But in any case, these forces ultimately left the nation of Islam, organizationally gelled in, uh, excuse me, left the Garvey movement, and organizationally that movement gelled in the nation of Islam under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it was that organization which took up the clash uh, between the dominant view among black intellectuals in the post-World War II, immediate post-World War II years, uh, and a developing appreciation of the fact that we had more in common with what was actually happening on the ground to Palestinians than what was happening on the ground in Palestine in terms of Zionist immigrants. I'd just like to just give you a brief example of this and then talk a little bit about Malcolm and then get out of the way uh, because we'll, we'll have time to say some things later on. As early as 1959, the civil rights leadership in the United States among black people was dominated by people who were thoroughly committed to the Zionist cause. Thurgood Marshall, a civil rights icon, attacked the nation of Islam in October of 1959 in a speech that he gave at Princeton University. And I'll just quote very briefly what he had to say. He accused the nation of Islam of being, quote, a bunch of thugs financed by Nasser or some Arab group. Right? 
the Nation of Islam responded in the press by saying that Marshall's speech was a consequence of Zionist ideology at its ugliest. One of the Nation of Islam's biographers, C. Eric Lincoln, at the same time interviewed Malcolm X, who was then the national spokesman of the Nation of Islam. Remember, this is as early as 1959. Malcolm had this to say, and I quote, in America, the Jews sapped the very lifeblood of the so-called Negroes to maintain the state of Israel, its armies, and its continued aggression against our brothers in the East. This every black man resents. Malcolm went on to say, the European and American Christians helped to establish Israel in order to get rid of the Jews so they could take over the businesses as they did the American Japanese during the war. But the American Jews weren't going anywhere. Israel is just an international poorhouse, which is maintained by money sucked from the poor suckers in America. End quote. This is Malcolm. He was particularly sensitive to this question of Zionism, not only because of the infinity for the Arab cause that he inherited from the nation of Islam and from the Garvey movement of his parents, but he had the opportunity to travel to the Middle East in 1959, spent time in the Arab world, including East Jerusalem. It was at that time that Malcolm established direct and lasting contact with Muslim leadership there. From that point to the end of his life, he was to receive Arab activists and Muslim scholars from the East at New York's Mosque Number no. 7 for the remainder of his sojourn in the Nation of Islam. He returned, of course, to the Arab world in 1964, not only making Hajj, but traveling to Egypt and Gaza and publicly taking up the cause of Palestinian liberation and anti-imperialist, Israeli imperialist expansion. On that same trip, we should note, he spent much time in Tanzania, Ghana, and Egypt with African revolutionaries who helped him develop a deeper briefing on the relationship of Zionism and Western imperial interest. Brother Abdul Akaman has already mentioned the very famous essay entitled Zionist Logic that Malcolm published in the Egyptian Gazette while still on the continent in 1964. He noted the parallels between the subjugation of Palestinians and Africans. He pointed out the strategic value of Israel to world imperialism. And this he had to say. The ever scheming European imperialists wisely placed Israel where she could geographically divide the Arab world, infiltrate and sow the seeds of dissension among African leaders and also divide the Africans against the Asians, right? Malcolm had disciples. He had them in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which just a few years after his death was able to advance a pro-Palestinian solidarity position inside of what was now developing as the Black Power Movement. It was as a part of that process that I got involved in the African liberation support effort among other activities. And what I found out was that it was impossible to talk about apartheid system in South Africa, to talk about the U.S. role in propping up apartheid, without also talking about the extensive involvement of the Zionist state of Israel in the maintenance, not only of apartheid in South Africa, but the whole colonial project on the African continent. Just briefly, let me show you a leaflet from 1976 put out by an organization that I work with, and of course, Brother Sam Anderson, called Blacks in Solidarity with South African Liberation. And in one of our important demonstrations, we noted that the same US corporations which support and maintain the racist and oppressive governments of South Africa and Israel, right? The same corporations were the same ones that were imposing fiscal retrenchment upon the urban areas of the United States. About the same time, I published a pamphlet called Southern Africa, Black America, Same Struggle, Same Fight, in which we outlined the specific involvement of Israel 
in propping up the South African state in terms of providing nuclear technology to naval ships, providing a way to transship and get around the UN boycott of the apartheid regime, the transshipping goods from the US in Israeli tag cargoes through Israel to South Africa, sharing military personnel with South African soldiers fighting in the Middle Eastern wars and Israeli soldiers providing technical assistance and logistical assistance to the apartheid regime's troops. Uh, and uh, so throughout the 70s, we found as we built that effort, which ultimately would become successful in helping to overthrow apartheid, we more and more uh, uh, revealed the, uh, uh, the connection. I could go on to much more, but of course, in the interest of time, there's just one more thing I want to mention before yielding my time at this point. I had moved on in the 90s and in the 2000s to the support work for Cuba. And for many years, I was a member of the uh, board of directors of the Interreligious Foundation on Community Organization, which was the sponsor of the um, caravans uh, of relief aid that were sent to Cuba and still continue for many years. About 10 years ago now, I think it was 2010, 2011, we became the fiscal sponsor of a British-based organization called Viva Palestina, which raised funds to support uh, a relief flotilla, as some may recall, trying to take aid into Gaza and the occupied areas. Because we became their fiscal sponsor in the United States, that is the Interreligious Foundation and Community Organization, we were subject to a year-long audit by the IRS. We had our tax exempt status removed, and we were only able, through persistent struggle, to maintain our existence as an organization. So it's very interesting that over the decades of my involvement in the struggle for liberation of black people, that as time goes on, it becomes manifestly clear that as we said earlier, Southern Africa, black America, same struggle, same fight. As we must say today, black America, Palestine, same struggle, same fight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rabab, but just briefly, um, the Rabab had mentioned the 1970 uh, statement in the New York Times that uh, I helped to put together along with a host of other people um, 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 William um, <laughs> drawing a blank on his name, Bill uh, Strickland, and, and, and Strickland, 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 right? Wow, so, yeah. Bill, Bill Strickland. Strick. Uh, Bill, Bill Look, Strickland. I learned from all of you too. So I you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, that that statement, in, in terms of uh, just talking about repercussions, we all talked about the different repercussions if you if you come out against Zionism. My repercussion was. Um, uh, I was teaching at Sarah Lawrence, and my repercussion was the reduction of my my stay on the campus uh, to, from five days full time to one day, and, which means that you're fired, you know, um, because of the statement that that uh, I signed and, and helped to uh, organize. Um, Sister Rabab. Um, I actually, we want you to talk more about this later on because even though we've discussed this many times, we always have different audiences and different people joining us. So this is also the same that we have to talk more about that. I also have a lot of things to say. So I just want to say a couple of things now is that one of the reasons we are actually able to have uh, this event today is because uh, the People's Forum has thankfully, and I want to thank specifically Layan Folihan and David Chung and the whole board of the People's Forum who are giving Ahmed studies a temporary refuge because of shutdown of our uh, page 
by uh, Facebook. And we would not have been able to do it had it not been for that. Uh, we will be coming back and discussing more what, what does the silencing mean and what do we do against it and how do we understand the whole accusations, exceptionalizing Palestine and the accusations of anti-Semitism in order to silence uh, Palestine and disconnect Palestine from other struggles for justice, uh, especially including uh, we're focusing on uh, black liberation. For But now I'm going to stop and introduce my dear sister and my friend and colleague and also co-conspirator Dr. Rosemary Mealy, who is an adjunct assistant professor at City College uh, of New York CUNY, which I'm very happy to have been an alum of uh, Hunter College at Hunter College. Uh, she's a notably recognized activist for peace, social and economic justice. Her work involves years of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle and the Cuban revolution, including living and working in that country. In 2011, Dr. Mealy was awarded the Friendship Medal by the Council of States of the Republic of Cuba. She is the author of numerous publications, including Fidel and Malcolm uh, X, Memories of a Meeting, and she is a member of the board of IFCO, uh, F uh, Pastors for Peace, uh, the New York Cuba Sea Coalition, and the National Conference of Black Lawyers. And when we met, uh, Rosemary was also the United Nations representative of the of the national of, of, of uh, national alliance of third world journalists, I believe, and a reporter at WBI Pacifica. I turn it over to you. There's more, much more to say, but I'm going to turn it over to you, Rosemary. Please. Thank you very much, Berlab, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to have a few minutes to share some perspectives on. Malcolm X's political evolution in relationship to transforming um, the question of gender. And I'm, I'm just kind of linking that to the whole focus of uh, my little piece here on Fidel Castro and the Cuban de uh, delegation's arrival in Harlem at the 15th United Nations General Assembly in 1960. But just picking up on um, Bill and um, Akalimat, Oftentimes when we talk about Malcolm, we leave out the gender issue. And I just wanna briefly state that that's something that we should never forget. And I mentioned his transformative evolutions relative to the question of gender, obviously, which we've discussed here this afternoon, beginning with his mother and later his political, re his political relationships with active black women, all of which had an enduring impact on both of his philosophical beliefs and his actions and were essential to his transformation. And this idea is also validated as well when we study his political relationships with leaders on the African continent, the Caribbean, Asia, and Latin America. There's more to, to that. I did an essay on that and I'll put it in the chat. There's more to that aspects of that evolution that I would share in, in, a, um, in an essay that I did a couple of years ago. But let's go back to um, Malcolm and uh, Fidel and why I have this portion of the presentation. For many of us who've traveled to Cuba, uh, we've also oftentimes been able to meet with the Palestinian delegations. And historically, we've learned that there's been this constant relationship between Cuba and the Palestinian struggles. Uh, we meet, uh, oftentimes we meet students who have attended or are attending the, the medical school in Cuba. Uh, we've met uh, delegations of students who are studying uh, farming and, and just a, a massive aspect of how the Cuban revolution solidarity has extended to the Palestinian struggles and the Palestinian peoples. But here's a historical piece that I think is important for us also to link. In September of 1960, when Fidel came to uh, the United Nations for the 15th United Nations General Assembly, and, and, and they're subsequently moved to 10 days in Harlem at the Teresa Hotel, that infamous meeting between Fidel and Malcolm rather was not the beginning of the Cuban uh, nation's solidarity between African peoples and the, and the peoples of Cuba. Oftentimes people think that history starts at the moment of learning about one incident, one aspect, one piece of history. But that uh, historical relation, but those historical relationships between Cuba, the African liberation movement, and in this instance, because we're talking about uh, Malcolm, represented a continuation of more than a hundred year history of a solidarity born in the enslavement 
of African peoples in Cuba and the United States and the, and the fight against uh, which uh, those which are central, central to an understanding of how that uh, historical, um, those historical relationships have been a continuum. So since the very beginning of the Cuban revolution, they, uh, there was open and clear linkage between the black liberation movement in the United States and the Cuban leadership. So that meeting between Malcolm and Fidel basically solidified those bonds when he met on September 18, 1960 with Commander Fidel Castro and the Cuban revolution. And, and that it was perhaps just symbolic. The symbolism and the importance of that meeting must not be dismissed. The delegation was to stay, as I mentioned earlier, at the Hotel Shelburne. Well, I didn't state that earlier, but initially the delegation was to stay at the Hotel Shelburne, which was on 34th Street in the midtown of, in the midtown of, uh, of, of, uh, of Manhattan. So when the delegation refused to accept this exorbitant uh, price that uh, the administration at the Shelburne Hotel uh, offered to the Cubans, Fidel threatened to set up tents on the grounds of the United Nations. So after community folks and progressive organizations heard how the Cubans were being treated, the stay was arranged for them to come to Harlem by uh, one of the Cuban diplomats at the time, a junior dip diplomat at the time. So the invitation was accepted. And as a sidebar, according to the late civil rights attorney, Conrad Lynn, Financial support was acquired from one of Harlem's most notorious bookies, or what we call numbers dealers. His name was Bumpy Johnson. So with the hotel cost taken care of, the delegation's invite, invitation to Harlem was sealed, and they all checked in to the Hotel Teresa on 125th Street. The Cuban leaderships uh, under, understood very well from the very beginning days, and this was doing uh, in the United States, the Eisenhower administration, the Cubans understood that the black movement provided a base for the progressive and anti-imperialist forces to, uh, to neutralize these draconian plans of the intelligence agencies, the CIA, because as a victim of local federal and CIA intelligence himself, Malcolm understood this firsthand. So while the mutual correlation of distrust between the Cubans and black folk further gave context and rationalization why the Cubans accepted this invitation, and that was one another reason for why they moved to, the, to Harlem. It would also expose on an international stage the hypocrisy of an American government that professed the sanctity of equality and individual liberties while they simultaneously neglected the civil rights struggles of its own people right here in the United States. To American political elites, so-called Castro's quote, move was nothing more than a political stunt. Nevertheless, in, in the context of what appears in what we know as the Cold War bilateralism that existed at the time, this could be interpreted in no other way as a public relations disaster, but it was a public relations disaster for the United States government. So it was just before midnight, and I'll just briefly go through this, when uh, September 19th was the date, when Fidel met with Malcolm upstairs at the hotel, in the hotel, um, in, the, in the hotel, it was just one room. The details of the conversation between the two leaders are chronicled with many interviews in my book, uh, Fidel and Malcolm X, Memories of a Meeting, which I have put the, uh, the chat and how you can acquire the book, it's in the chat. So this one person interviewed reflected that Malcolm told Fidel, he told him from my interviews with Fidel and also from other representatives who traveled to, to the United States with Fidel and other folk that I was able to interview in the United States, particularly in Harlem. Malcolm told Fidel, quote, you have won the struggles for your people in Cuba, and we are still fighting for ours here. And here we could go so far as to imply that Malcolm recognized that Cuba, under the leadership of Fidel, like so many other leaders in developing countries, 
that were following successful liberation struggles at the time, and this one being a struggle of socialism, Malcolm understood that during this meeting, that by these two leaders converging and including the topic of racial discrimination in the United States, US-Cuban relations and Fidel's plan for his speech at the U UN, he would incorporate that. And in closing, furthermore, at the time of the meeting, racism and race relations in the United States were at a boiling point, much like we see now, compounded by ten tense Cold War politics, just like we see now. Fidel's speech at the United Nations and his meeting with Malcolm X thrust what was known as the black problem in America, front and stage, front and center, onto a volatile international political landscape. And that's why we were able to see a few months ago when more than 180 nations came together at the United States demanding, at the United Nations, I'm sorry, demanding that the United States lift its criminal inhumane embargo against Cuba with only two nations supporting the continuation of the embargo or what we call the blockade. And those two nations were the United States and Israel. So we have a common enemy in a common struggle, but that history of 60 years ago teaches us that coming together in unity, we can only struggle and raise these issues as the Palestinian people are raising, as black folk in this country are raising that one struggle, same fight. Thank you so much because our oppression is ceaseless and we have to take it on and we have to support socialist construction in Cuba. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sister Rosemary. Uh, we will be able to talk more. I wanted to, um, I'm just really elated. I have so much more uh, to say and add. I do want to echo what you are talking about in terms of Cuban support and solidarity with Palestine. Uh, the, and in this particular instance, I want to mention also uh, Che Guevara's visit uh, to Palestine as like uh, Malcolm X also went to Gaza and connected and the region and spoke about the, the struggle with Palestine and also connected it with the international as well. So this kind of like speaks against exceptionalizing because it was also against the US intervention in the war of Vietnam. It was in support of uh, liberation movements throughout Africa, Asia and Latin America. It was uh, in support of people struggling here in people say United States, Turtle Island, the Western Hemisphere, i.e. the world that was uh, colonized, uh, part of European settler colonialism uh, after 1492. And so this is really, and there is so much history we can speak about, a lot about it. So uh, we can talk about later on in the program. Uh, I wanted to just say, you mentioned uh, Malcolm X and the impact of women on his life. And one of the main uh, impact was Ella Collins, his sister, who actually acted like his mother. And she was one of the signers of the statement that Sam uh, co-edited with Bill Strickland and many people have signed that we had uh, all this past year, we had multiple uh, events on it. And in that sense, also uh, one of the people who are also from the Collins family who just departed is Terry Collins, the amazing uh, leader, black leader, leader of the Black Student Union, the Third World Liberation from Black Panther Party at San Francisco State University. And he had just uh, passed on July 8th uh, this year, which was the same day, the anniversary of the assassination of a well-known Palestinian writer and author and intellectual, Hussein Kenafani, also at the hand of the Israeli Mossad. So I'm sure we're going to come back to that and talk about what happens to our leaders and how they are constantly, you build movements and constantly movements keep getting attacked. And uh, But uh, I want to next... Uh, um, as, uh, introduce uh, Sister Aisha Al-Adawiyah. Uh, Sister Aisha Al-Adawiyah is the founder and president of Women in Islam Inc., uh, an organization of Muslim women that focuses on human rights and social justice. She represents Muslim women non-governmental organizations at the United Nations uh, Forum, and she coordinates Islamic input for the preservation of black religious heritage documentation project of the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture. Uh, she organized and participated in multiple conferences on Islam, gender, equity, conflict resolution, cross-cultural understanding, and peace building. 
Uh, she's a consultant with multiple uh, interfaith organizations and documentary projects of Muslim American experiences and who also served on the boards of uh, many organizations in the global Islamic community. And we've asked you specifically in this part to speak about your oral histories, your history, and we really wanted you to address also the archiving of Malcolm X and your role as an archivist at the Schomburg Library. I actually remember going to Schomburg and speaking at Schomburg, not only visiting as a student and as taking my students there, but also I was actually speaking there. Some of it compliments of Sam Anderson, who was organizing the virtual Malcolm X Museum. And some of them were actually moderated by Gil Nobel and some were through Elan Bebra. So this is, this is a lot of history on that. So please, um, we're very happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us, Sister Aisha. Well, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's an honor, really, to join you. Uh, I, I, I'm really taken aback uh, seeing uh, faces that I haven't seen. Can you increase your volume? Uh, I, I don't think I can. It's maximum now. So I hope we can manage the, this. Uh, I, I'm at maximum. The computer, we can hear you better. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So, um, so again, I'm, I'm happy to see people that I haven't seen for a long time, but I've also worked with some of them over the years. Uh, I'm struck by uh, Sinke and, and how much he looks like his father, uh, uh, Ilombe, who really brought Africa to us in Harlem. Uh, so many years ago, and we're grateful for those educational uh, experiences. Uh, I, I um, actually, Sam was sending my emails to an address that I don't access uh, uh, regularly, so I missed uh, my topic. So thank you, Dr. Rabab, for reminding me what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, let me just say, um, I was born and raised in uh, Alabama. Uh, uh, in uh, I'm 77 years old, so I grew up as a Christian in the segregated uh, South, uh, uh, segregated and of course unequal, very unequal South. Uh, so I already had the experience of what it feels like uh, to be an oppressed person, uh, although unconsciously, uh, but experiencing that on a daily basis. So moving to New York in the early 60s, uh, I uh, encountered um, Malcolm X. And that was a life-altering experience for me. Uh, after embracing Islam in the early 70s, uh, I uh, entered a community that had people coming from all over the world as Muslims including uh, Palestinians. So I already felt an affinity with the Palestinian people because these were people that I had um, learned to uh, live in love with uh, uh, as a young Muslim adult. Uh, so uh, my, my, my experience as you know, being conscious of the apartheid, anti-apartheid uh, movement in South Africa uh, kind of was the catalyst for me to really understand what it meant uh, to uh, be uh, a resistance fighter, if you will, against these kinds of forces. Uh, and it really uh, brought into uh, sharp review how connected all of these forms of oppression actually are. Um, I, uh, uh, at the Schomburg Center uh, early on, uh, with uh, Sam Anderson, of course, as one of the founders of the Malcolm X Museum, uh, we did forums at the Schomburg Center uh, twice a year annually uh, for over, for I would say nearly 20 years. Uh, we didn't miss a beat. And these were all very uh, powerful educational experiences. And I recall uh, two in particular. Uh, Rosemary mentioned uh, Malcolm and women, and one of them was uh, titled Women Speak About Malcolm. And on that first one, Rosemary was a panelist uh, to bring into sharp review 
uh, who Malcolm actually was and what his position was on women. Uh, and uh, more recently, I did another one uh, with the same title uh, with a different group uh, of, of uh, young Muslim women talking about uh, Malcolm and his impact on them. Actually, it wasn't just Muslim women, it was women. Uh, so so, so th those are the kinds of um, uh, continuums that uh, help keep me grounded in the work that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I also uh, found it very interesting uh, to uh, uh, note that for someone who's been involved over really several decades of interfaith work, uh, something that I was very passionate about, coming from a Christian uh, family uh, in the South uh, and uh, uh, entering Islam. And now in this interfaith space, uh, I felt I was uh, more than qualified to speak, you know, on this issue of uh, interfaith collaboration, uh, since my family uh, is, is part of that group as well. Uh, I came uh, to know uh, more recently uh, I, uh, of course, I uh, became a member of the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies uh, early on. And again, uh, I am a believer in uh, uh, traditional Islamic knowledge, uh, and uh, I, I advocate for that in addition to secular uh, 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 knowledge. Uh, so I, I, I joined this organization and uh, what brought my activism in that organization to a head was uh, a statement that was put out by the forum, which is headquartered in Abu Dhabi, uh, a statement that said um, the board members at our last uh, meeting, at our last board meeting, that we had agreed, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, that we had agreed uh, uh, that uh, it was a good thing for uh, Abu Dhabi uh, to open up diplomatic relations with uh, Israel. And uh, there was no such uh, 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 decision taken uh, at that meeting because I was present, uh, nor was it even discussed at that meeting. Uh, my picture was included in that statement that went out broadly so I felt obviously compelled uh, to withdraw uh, from the organization. And this was something that, that I uh, treasured, uh, being able to have an international platform to, again, talk about uh, building relationships across artificial divides. Uh, but then that brought me to this conversation about faith washing, which is now what we are calling it calling this, um, uh, and there are so many other organizations, faith-based faith -based organizations that I've been a part of that I'm now having to extract myself from because the recent iteration of Israeli op uh, occupation and oppression and genocide against the Palestinian people has come full circle when we uh, asked uh, organizations that were dear to my heart uh, to uh, issue a statement about uh, these atrocities that <clears throat> have uh, 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 protection under international law and so forth. <clears throat> Still, uh, these organizations were only able to regurgitate uh, the the statement that you know somehow these uh, these. Uh, equal um, uh, offenses of both sides. It, this is the usual rhetoric that we're given. Uh, I was active around the Bosnian genocide as well, and it was the same kind of language and many of the same people uh, involved in these atrocities. So I'm finding myself now having to move away from uh, many of the organizations, faith-based organizations, that I loved uh, 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 for many years uh, because of their inability or unwillingness 
uh, to uh, uh, state the obvious. So uh, that brings me to a place now where um, I'm having to reassess those activities uh, because they no longer serve uh, the issue of truth and justice. Uh, but again, uh, it's an avenue for people to be manipulated and used against themselves uh, and against uh, what is just and right in the world view. So uh, that. Now, at the Schomburg Center, uh, many of the programs, as I said, uh, that these were specifically related uh, to Malcolm X, but they covered a broad spectrum of, uh, of uh, issues, including Cuba, uh, two of the programs that we did uh, under the auspices of the museum, the Malcolm X Museum, uh, dealt with uh, Malcolm and internationalism. And uh, one particular program uh, invited um, uh, uh, Cuban participation. So we had uh, an ambassador from Cuba uh, to come and uh, talk about uh, the events there and other people in the community, obviously, who are in solidarity uh, with uh, the Cubans uh, and their struggle, continuing struggle. struggle. Uh, so so um, I'm in a place now where I'm about to retire from the Schomburg Center uh, and, you know, I must say that uh, in, in all of the uh, institutions that we have, uh, there, are, there are challenges when we begin to talk about um, uh, Islamophobia, about Muslims in general, and of course, the issue of Palestine it, it is the red line. So I, I, I'm looking for avenues uh, still uh, to continue uh, to talk, uh, to advocate, uh, to speak truth to power in these instances. I'm at a stage in my life where I'm no longer interested or quite frankly, I don't care about uh, what career uh, uh, repercussions there might be because I'm going to be retiring any time now. But uh, how do we bring this conversation uh, forward uh, uh, in the face of, of such uh, enormous uh, 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 resources that are put against us when we try to speak about these issues. And this brings me now to what's happening in Afghanistan, um, uh, where we're going to see the same thing uh, play out again. And I would like for us to consider finding ways to make these connections Again, uh, I'm coming from Bosnia. Well, first, my own experience as an African in America. Uh, uh, Bosnia, that was my uh, uh, first uh, international foray into uh, genocide. <laughs> um, and then uh, we have now uh, Haiti. I'm, I'm struck by uh, uh, how little, even on social media, there is about uh, the crises in Haiti. Uh, I don't really expect anything from corporate media uh, 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 in, that, in that way, uh, but I did uh, think that there would be more um, uh, 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 awareness uh, on social media or even the courage to uh, report on it. Uh, but you know, I, I, I see all of these issues as so interconnected and Palestine is certainly uh, 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 not excluded from that list. So I, there is a, a, a letter, actually it's a note that I sent to the forum, my letter of resignation from the forum. Uh, I will place that in the chat for anyone who would like to see it. Uh, uh, I, I, I would ask that we try to think about ways to meld all of these atrocities that are happening on a global le level. And as Muslims, uh, we are faced with so many uh, different uh, atrocities uh, globally. And here in New York, although we are in the United States, uh, we are impacted heavily by everything that happens around the world. So, and, and it's the same hand, you know, the puppet's hand, the puppeteer is the same. So let us think about that and how we can bring uh, our uh, intellect, our spirits, our hearts 
together uh, to fight this monster uh, because it's growing even among our own people, you know, regurgitate the same nonsense that uh, oppressors uh, 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 create for them. And I find this particularly noxious within academia where so many of our people uh, have just signed off on the dotted line. So um, I hope that um, I've made some sense here, but I, I, I think that um, you can understand that I'm really spread out all over the world, uh, the globe, trying to address, you know, these hotspots uh, as they come to us. But my uh, message is that it's all related and it's not okay to hide uh, that, you know, it's somebody else's problem. It's somewhere. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sister Aisha. It's, uh, it's very uh, opportune that you've mentioned uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. Actually, it's time for me to plug in that we have um, an event coming up on September 11th, 2021, on the 20th anniversary called Whose Narratives? Uh, 20 years post 9-11-2001, and we are looking a critical look on this uh, event and what has happened and why, how is it named? Uh, September 11, 2001 uh, had took place a few weeks right after the Durban Conference against racism. And it also, um, uh, a little bit over a year since the Aqsa Intifada has started and Israel was wreaking havoc in uh, Palestinian towns, cities, and villages. And, uh, but then the United States presented it as the most important watershed moment in the world. And also, of course, we can see how Islamophobia, Orientalism, and uh, various ways of racism and, uh, and um, um, profiling uh, against Arabs, Muslims, Central, South Asians, and all uh, persons of color, indigenous people have escalated under the excuse of security. So I'm not, I'm, I just want to invite people to attend. We will post a flyer on that, but this is something that's really, really important that hasn't been discussed. I would like, if possible, when we go in the second round, maybe you can speak about how can we also access Schomburg Library resources and how are we able to find resources on this topic that we're talking about, Black, uh, Palestinian uh, solidarities, the same struggle, same fight, the histories and so on, because sometimes it's really, really difficult. I find in my own teaching, uh, when I teach and, and, uh, and actually even discussing Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies within the broader academy, within critical race theory and within ethnic studies, that many people do not know the history of what happened in 1492 with the expulsion of Muslims uh, and Jews and the Inquisition in the Iberian Peninsula with the racism that was escalated in the in the, in, in by Spain and enabled it actually to uh, go and invade and set up settler colonial pr project in the Western Hemisphere and also with the rise of Islamophobia as well as the history of the kidnapping and imprisonment and enslavement of people from Africa many of whom were Muslim. So that a lot of the stuff is actually not known in the academy. So this is part of the, the history that we need to kind of explore. So I'm just raising it as something that we, we would might want to think about and think about how do we do that. But I would like to maybe move on to um, our uh, second uh, uh, round of questions and see what people, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'll raise the questions and, for, uh, and uh, send it over to my brother Sam to uh, decide, figure out how the order of the discussion will be. The questions in the second round. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Hold on a minute, let me just shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, one question. Yeah. yeah. There are three general, um, well, actually um, four general questions. One is uh, how do we challenge Zionist agenda of attempting to exceptionalize Palestine and place it outside the orbit of international of the internationalism and constant solidarity uh, of Harlem in particular and of Black liberation in general. That's just one question. Um, how do, second? How does uh, Black liberation and the struggle against exploitation, colonialism, 
white supremacy, xenophobia, Islamophobia, sexism and homophobia, ageism, and all forms of injustice connect with Palestine. Uh, third is how do we respond to the perennial Zionist accusations of anti-Semitism anytime anyone speaks up for justice in, in or for uh, Palestine? And the last was, what have your personal experiences um, uh, been with silencing uh, and the cost of your own life when you spoke up for Palestine? So those are broad um, questions that would probably take a day for each one. <laughs> um, um, for uh, Brother Abdul, uh, Brother Sales, Sister Rosemary, Sinke, Ahmad, um, uh, you know, those are the questions. I guess we could start with anyone that seems to be uh, burning in, in, um, in, 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 in you to, to get out and, and express and analyze. I, I would like to, say, like to say Okay. I think that question about um, equating uh, Zionism with um, you know, when people tell you you're 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 anti-Israel, uh, I, mean, I mean, they're always going to say, I mean, anti-Semite. They're always going to say that, and I and 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 it it's said in our generation. It's gonna it's said in the one before. It's a continuum, you know, as long as Israel has existed, that has been a, a burning uh, question that people will challenge you on when you're in opposition to, um, to, to, to Zionism. And I think that it's important to understand what Zionism is, and then you can frame an intelligent argument, you know, that one does not have to, one can support the Palestinian people, or well, one can, one has the right to criticize Israel for its apartheid positions, its, its oppression of, of even its own people internally. So I, I think that it that that question is a common sense response. You know, I think, and and I and I'm not being, you know, I'm not trying to to say that it's not important, but I'm just letting the, whoever asked that question that it's nothing new. You know, so other people may want to respond. On the and I'll just I'll just answer the other the other burning question for me and that was the impact of being supportive of the Palestinian struggle. Bill Sales mentioned how we were in an organization we were both in an organization, uh, if co pastors for peace. And Sister Aisha, you will be welcome to join our organization. We're we're an interdenominational interfaith organization. We will welcome your participation. We need people like you in there. Um, but, you know, personally, from a personal point of view as a journalist, you know, I've, I've done radio and, and, and um, Rabab can tell you this. I've had radio shows where people have called and uh, we, have Zoom, we have Zoom balls now where people have called in and, you know, attempted to undermine the program. I've had that happen. I have, pers from a personal point of view, being a member of the formerly member of the National Alliance of Third World Journalists, where we've written articles about it and we've been fired. So, you know, it, it's something that that you have to, just like being a member of, of other organizations, you have an FBI files and certainly th that's going to impact on your employment. But the point is, if, if you believe in what you're doing, those are kind of like the sacrifices and the choices that you make. And I think each one of us here have been under attack and we just keep um, struggling. I mean, it's about principle. You don't give up on your principles. You don't try to water your position down, but you, you take the information and you use the information as a weapon against these attacks that come at you personally as well as politically. I, I wanted to just um, follow up on what Sister Rosemary was saying. And, you know, I wanted to co concur with that. Uh, you know, often I call pool to work with people who are not political, right? They, or at least not surfacely political or, or active. They're not affiliated with anything. They're lay people for the most part. And when that question of, and everybody under, the question of anti-Semitism sort of came up and was brought up before and everybody understood that all you have to do is say, I disagree. And these were people from all different walks of life. So it's understood, you know, by people that the way 
they and it's handled here as almost as Israel is beyond reproach, and you cannot say anything about them. And I think what's good that is happening because of social media, because of the digitization of things, some of the younger generation is getting that understanding early. You take, for example, the social media former personality Mark Lamont Hill. He lost his position at CNN for uh, being what they considered anti-Semitic, where he did. He had a position against Zionism, and it was consistent with many in our community. Um, he did, and you know, before it was a, he he like I really I'm not gonna really apologize for that sort of thing. <laughs> what I said in my position with it, this is what it is, and I was surprised to see how many quote unquote celebrities, blue check people were supportive or like, yeah, no, I believe I agree what you said and what you said. So I I, be, I believe that we are coming to a time because of social media where people who are quote unquote, not political, lay people who don't really understand this chronology, this history that we're talking about, they are beginning to get it. And so that leads me to addressing one of the questions uh, Sam put out earlier about um, what what are some things that we can do. Well, one of the things I think we can do, for example, the Alambe Brad Foundation, we're in the business of digitizing some of these programs um, from the Patrice Lumumba Coalition held in Harlem for over 30 years, um, where many times the issue is Palestine. Those sort of things, if they're not digitized, if they're not taken from these tapes and these recorders and they're not digitized, they're lost to a whole new generation. One of the things we're beginning to do is to, to digitize them. You know, not only issues of Palestinians, uh, black liberation movement, fallen freedom fighters, political prisoners, uh, South Africa, Vietnam, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, because when you begin to digitize it, then you can put it online. And once you put it online, young people will find it. These millennials will find it and they will do things with it that you will not expect them to do with some of these mediums. Yeah, TikTok, Instagram, some of these things will be blocked, but it still will reach some of them and they will get it. In addition to that, we're working with, I'm on the board of another organization with a lot of people who are experts in this field. It's called Upama, right? And we have people like Baruti um, Bidiaco, Melvin Simmons, who's been doing this in public access TV for uh, 40 years, Basim Chawi, Ellen G Gary, Bernard White, himself, many of them, and that's that's our goal, to digitize into things, and it's not just Elon Big Rath Foundation, Patrice Lumumba, Africa Kaleidoscope, or BAI. We're talking about our goal is to digitize, save, and preserve for younger people works of Professor Sales when he was speaking somewhere. If they have it, they have an archive, a trove of information that we've begun to digitize, you know what I mean? We've had two programs, we've raised money to digitize those things so that um, when Sister Rosemary had comes and she speaks about Shay, Fidel, Malcolm, et cetera, and people think that no one has that. No, somebody has that. It's just in a format that's not conducive for today's usage. We're gonna put it in that format. We're gonna make it available so that these younger generations can get to it and use it in their formats so we can keep a chronology to show the consistency of what, what we've been saying for decades. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be uh, uh, Ahmad who was going to go next, and then we're actually going to skip the concluding remarks and go into also suggestions. So people can uh, respond to the questions and also say, what do you think? What are some of the suggestions that people can do? Where do we go from here? Thank you, Dr. Rabab. Uh, so I, I just wanted to touch on the fourth question, which was, you know, the impacts uh, of the advocacy, um, you know, on our livelihoods, or the costs and experience that we've had. Uh, I've had uh, experiences both individually, um, but also with the organizations that I've um, been in leadership of. So I, you know, first would like to talk about the Dream Defenders and the Movement for Black Lives Policy Platform. This platform was issued in 2016. And within this visionary document they also had you know uh, a section that talked about divest and invest and so divesting from you know the the military industrial complex and investing in black communities and investing in resources 
um, that communities in America are in need of. Um, and within that section, they talked about supporting BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement of Israel, um, and labeling Israel an apartheid state that commits genocide against the Palestinian people. Right after that policy platform was released, the Dream Defenders and many other organizations that were under the umbrella of the Movement for Black Lives um, had events canceled um, and also had funding um, eliminated. And so foundations literally picked up the phone and said, you've now crossed the line. Uh, we're, we're no longer gonna be able to uh, fund you. And I think what we saw is uh, from Dream Defenders and many of the other organizations in Movement for Black Lives, um, uh, a reluctance uh, to, to change that position. Um, you know, folks were committed to these positions because of a politic, uh, because of an ideology, because, because of an opposition to imperialism. And we affirmed that position shortly after we saw some of the responses. More recently with the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights, uh, we just uh, thankfully defeated a lawsuit that was uh, launched against us by the Jewish National Fund and several Israeli Americans alleging that we provided material support to terrorism because of our support of BDS, because of our support of the Great March of Return, uh, because of our support of Palestinian resistance on the ground. And thankfully, uh, the judge dismissed uh, the lawsuit against us. Uh, the opposition asked the judge for reconsideration. The judge rejected uh, the call for reconsideration. And now we expect that the JNF and the parties will uh, file for an appeal. And so that is a battle we'll continue to fight and wage. And we know that we have wonderful lawyers, movement lawyers like the Center for Constitutional Rights. And we think justice is on our side and we will prevail. Personally, we've also dealt with many dynamics. I'm sure just like many other people here, I've dealt with uh, defamation um, in articles uh, alleging that, you know, I was a quote unquote terrorist. Um, of course, that I'm an anti-Semite was, was one of the allegations. Uh, this has happened in articles online, on uh, social media, and then on a website called Canary Mission, where the opposition has created profiles for hundreds of Palestinian or pro-Palestine activists to attempt to defame us and really uh, to attempt to limit um, the professional uh, activities or the professional advancements of so many young people committed to the cause. Uh, what actually caught me by surprise was more recently um, there was uh, uh, an attempt made to complain to the Florida Bar Association. I'm an attorney in the state of Florida and have license in the state of Florida. And there was a complaint filed with the Florida Bar alleging that I called for the genocide of of all Jews. Um, and so they were asking for me to lose my legal license. Um, thankfully, the Florida Bar quickly researched the matter and found it to be absurd. Uh, and, and so in addition to the, all those, I faced some, some surveillance from law enforcement, which again, I think others have as well. So what I'll say just in wrapping up is, you know, these challenges will be um, consistent. Uh, these challenges will be um, annoying. They will make us uncomfortable. But we have to be resolute um, in the fact that justice is on our side and that more people are gravitating towards our cause every single day. And so while it seems like at some point the opposition is insurmountable, what we need to recognize is that our will and our passion and our demand for justice is actually what is the most insurmountable. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you for you all's commitment to this cause and I appreciate being here with you today. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'd just like to add uh, another uh, layer of the personal experience. In 2018, I was invited to speak in Ramallah, Ramallah um, in August of 2018. And I, I flew into Amman, Jordan, and went to the border between Jordan and Israel, and was detained well, over seven hours in question, um, you know, why, who I am, and, you know, and then they finally got the history and so forth and discussion, and it went on and on. Um, the, and, and to make a long story short, um, I was denied entry into Israel to go to Palestine because they, their new constitution, the then new constitution said that anybody 
who uh, smells of BDS, uh, you know, we can always not allow them to come in, which made it which made which made it more challenging to do my presentation. Fortunately, the hotel um, where I, I was staying at in Amman was a young Palestinian uh, manager there, and I told him what my situation was, and he hooked up. Um, uh, an internet connection for me to do um, um, uh, uh, more or less like a, a Zoom presentation from my hotel room. And, and so I was able to get uh, my statement to the conference in that manner. Um, there was, uh, it, I, I didn't want to go into the, the details, there was, but it's very, very interesting that the uh, the, the security, the, 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 uh, the Zionist security were all people under 40 and they and and they um, confiscated my um, my bag, and the bag happened to have a few of my Black Holocaust for Beginners books in it. And they looked at it, and they were they were freaked out by <laughs> by that. Um, and that that even made them more um, uh, uh, crazy to to question me and so forth and so on. But uh, the, that's that's just the one of the most recent. Uh, run in with with uh, Zionism um, that I, I've had, and I'm certain that other people will have. Is there any other uh, person that might want to say something in, in any one of those three questions? So, Brother Abdul. Yes, uh, what I'd like to do is to is to make a few points that helps, particularly the comrades in Palestine, understand the conditions under which under which we struggle. I want to make five points. First point is there's manufactured ignorance about the Palestinian struggle. This is very serious because it really is just part of the general ignorance that the American population and a lot of people in the world don't understand that inside the belly of the beast, we remain ignorant. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that we have a spontaneous movement, Black Lives Matter, other forms of mass response. But what has not happened is that these mass forms of resistance have not sank deep roots in the working class in this country. That's the crisis. We have these sort of flash floods, young people, uh, and so on, courageous, strong fighters, but not yet turning to the working class, to the hard work of organizing people at the base of the society. Connected to that is the third point, which is the whole question of NGO funding. You know, we come out of the 60s when the movements were self-generated. Today, there's massive funding that's going in to bribe these young people some people who just joined the movement making fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year, uh, who themselves call themselves trainers of the people with no back experience. I know the Dream Defenders understands what I'm talking about. In other words, dealing with these funders is a critical moment. We didn't have this as much in the '60s. We've got it now. This is connected to mainstream leadership. The next point, the Congressional Black Caucus, et cetera, these are all people who are part of the Democratic establishment, even on the progressive wing, in quotes, of the Democratic Party, are tied to the funding and to the political control of these Zionist forces. And really, it's just really, they're really the face of U.S. capital. What we're really dealing with here is the strategy of the U.S. capital. And, and, and Israel and Zionism is, is really one of their tools and their toolkit for maintaining their control. And of course, the last point I wanna mention is the most obvious point, and that is the rising fascist movement that we face. And a part of that is, and this gets to what Aisha was talking about, is right wing Christian nationalism has become an ally of Israel. And so we've, we've got these evangelical, these big box churches that are replacing the traditional religious denominations. 
connecting this right wing to Israel. And so these are the forces that we face. But I want to say that there are positive signs. First sign is the survey research says that black people and young people support socialism in the United States. This is a fundamental shift in, in, in general attitude. So we have the opportunity for a new stage of organizing that we haven't really maximized at this point. And remember, the support for Israel, I mean, the support for the Palestinian struggle, as we've discovered, the support for the African liberation struggle has to do with, do we build a movement here? That's the critical issue. Do we build a movement here? And the last point, of course, is exactly the point about Palestine, because the survey research indicates young people are more and more in support of the Palestinian struggle. So the future is bright for us, but there's a lot of hard work to be done. I just want to make sure that the comrades in Palestine understand the conditions under which we struggle here in this country. May I make a, a couple of points? Uh, and very, very briefly, I think, I mean, first of all, I, we, don't, we don't really have time, but people can check. We've been subjected, myself and also the program, and uh, my students at San Francisco State, we have been subjected again and again. And anybody who's in the academy, and not just on the academy, but also outside who speaks up around Palestine has been. So I don't I agree with what uh, Brother Abdul said, what, what Ahmed said, what Sinke, what everybody has said, Rosemary, the experiences of Sam. I actually was, was going to speak about the experiences of uh, somebody like uh, Fred Dube, who was on the National Executive uh, Committee of the African National Congress in the 80s. And he was fired by Governor Cuomo from New York for ostensibly giving a lecture on political Zionism, but actually Fred Duba was co-organizing with us this big campaign in 1985 called Israel and South Africa, the Apartheid Connection. And it entered the congressional record. So we actually have it from the congressional record. This is when I was working with the Palestine Solidarity Committee at the time. But there has been many more and more and more attacks. And this has to also do with the ways in which the fact that the Zionist, the Israel is losing its public relations campaign. Israel historically has assigned its security agencies, its ministries, ministry, they even have a whole ministry of strategic affairs. Now they're say, claiming that it's not active and so on, but the, the minister is now the US uh, UN ambassador of Israel. So it's uh, they, they're very much concerned about that because Israel has historically wanted the, the everybody in the world, but specifically the Palestinians to acknowledge the legitimacy of Zionism, settler colonial project in Palestine. This is really, it's about it. It's not about the Jews, because there are many Jews historically, more Jews than, than uh, more Jews who and are anti-Zionist than Jews who are supportive of Zionism, including the theoretical historians and so on and so forth. We don't have time to get into all of this. But now Israel is losing more and more the public relations. And the more Israel is losing the public relations campaign, including in the United States, which Israel believes that it is main arena for support, the more the pro-Israeli forces and this the, the apologists for Israel in the US, very well organized lobby, that's not only the registered lobby, are going to bully, attack, silence, intimidate, punish and discipline anybody who speaks up because they have to try to delegitimize, not only speaking up for Palestine, they have to send the chilling uh, fear into anybody who might think that they want to speak about Palestine. And they are also very concerned about the fact that more and more and more movements against racism, against white supremacy, against against uh, uh, homophobia, against uh, gender repression, against environmental degradation, exploitation and so on, are aligning themselves more and more and more with Palestine. The more that happens, the more Israel is aligning itself with the right wing and the more it's enlisting everything it can. And we actually saw an escalation of that during the, the clear fascistic rule of Trump. I mean, now we can even talk about what's going on in this country and so on, but we don't have enough time because we're about to finish. But what they actually resorted, they got Trump to pass the so-called anti-Semitism uh, um, act, which was the main supporters, which is support of what Professor Abdul is talking about, is uh, main supporters, advocates were the right-wing Christian Zionists, 
the Christian Zionists. They also were the ones who were more advocating for moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They were also the ones who were pushing for Israel, for the U.S. to, uh, to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights and so on and so forth. They were as if they are in rush against time in order for them to get everything else. And this is the biggest issue is that Zionism is an illegitimate project, it's settler colonialism. And it is, and, and, and many, many people, Jews, non-Jews, Blacks, Palestinians, Muslims, uh, Latin, Latin people, indigenous people, people have spoken about this again and again. The last thing I want to say that I think it's really, really important is that, uh, and you spoke about that, Professor Abdul, is the labor movement. In the sense that now we are actually seeing more changes in the labor movement because it's been really the hardest not to crack in terms of Palestine. It's been really, really difficult. And now more and more labor unions, especially teachers union, especially public school unions, the CUNY, for example, uh, the, the CUNY professional staff uh, Congress has passed several resolutions by now on Palestine. There is more and more of this. So we're going to see more attacks on the US campaign for Palestinian rights, on the legal uh, organization that support, on the people who speak out, before we get to the point where we're actually able to breathe, it's going to get harder and harder and harder because they are really, they are in a, in a rush with history for that. So I think organizing, coming together is so and is really, really important. And this is one of the things why we're doing this. They shut us down with the Facebook page. We go and, and get hosted on another page people's platform we uh, the university cuts down our classes we uh, we teach online we do this the, what we are doing here so it is a question of how we do it it is a very big cost but i think maybe we can like maybe people can also end with saying other either ad ad adding what people want to say but also what other things what can we do next because obviously this is not enough two hours is never enough with all this knowledge here <laughs> Do I have, do I have time to mention a last story or we or is, is that Let's it? see if if Professor Bill Sales and okay. uh, and Sister Aisha need to say something and then we can come back if that's okay that's okay Sam right Go ahead. Well uh, am am I audible Yes Okay, okay. I lost connection for some reason there, so I apologize for that. Uh, just briefly, um, I'm see. I, I'm. Uh, there are so many issues pressing on people uh, uh, in this space. You know, working to to bring real change for people's lives and their humanity and their dignity. Uh, and so I want to mention uh, Jamil Alamin uh, and other uh, political prisoners and what is happening uh, there. So, uh, you know, it, it is the reality that black folks tend to show up for everybody's struggle, you know. I mean, that's just what we do because we know what the experience, what the experiences are of oppression. So I want to encourage uh, that kind of recip reciprocity from from uh, not only a Palestinian community. And I'm heartened when I see signs from people in Palestine of all places, you know, showing solidarity with the oppression of people back here in the United States. So I think that uh, if we can, what Malcolm used to say, you know, what he said once was, if you slap someone, you know, it's just, you know, it doesn't really impact, it doesn't have the impact that it needs uh, to address the situation at hand, but he but he said if you close the digits, you know, you know, and if you use the same force with your fist, you get a different kind of result. So it's now time for us to close the digits, to just get a get rid of all of the uh, barricades, the artificial barricades that have been put before us, and that we as a people have bought into on so many levels. So it's not, It's also time for us to clean house and recognize the enemy as one. I, under, I understand now that Zionists are going into, uh, the, uh, into Africa in the, what, what place is that? I forget the name of it, but they're everywhere. You know, now, you know, it, it's like they're on the front lines of humanitarian health cry, all of these things, you know, let me see. It's just uh, amazing how 
uh, we are prepared to close our eyes, you know, to atrocities. Uh, but we forget that we living in the United States are on occupied land. And so to make sure that we include the Native, Native American experience, because too many of our people don't acknowledge the fact that we are living on occupied land and the atrocities and the genocide that has happened uh, to Native Americans, not to mention the enslavement of African peoples. I don't think you're going to have to uh, look very far to find too many, too many uh, black folks who can uh, 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 feel empathy and want to be supportive of the Palestinian struggle for liberation. But again, uh, uh, the mind is a terrible thing uh, to lose or to waste and to get at the minds of young people because now we have them, they are in very uh, high places, uh, close to power as they see it. And they are comfortable there with their jobs and their titles and the alphabets behind their names, right? So those are not the ones who are really going to make any kind of risk move you know, for liberation, not only for themselves, but certainly for other people. So alternative ways of teaching people. Uh, I mean, that that's where I am now because, you know, I there's only so much is going to happen in the university. So it's going to have to be on the ground. And I mean, what do we do uh, to take back our children, take back the minds of our children and to educate ourselves and, and then have a strong spiritual foundation to get us through the hard times because we should expect to be challenged. I mean, we will be very naive not to expect to be challenges. So when we hear young people saying, oh, or even old people talking about these are not our values, these are indeed our values. These are American values. Uh, what, who was it who said, um, Rap Brown has said that uh, violence is as American as apple pie, you know. So, so, so how do we reach young minds? And I understand that we have students online here and it'll be up to the teachers, you know, who have their attention uh, to find ways uh, to uh, bring them along because they're the ones who are going to inherit uh, the struggle after we are gone. And I'm looking at the gray hairs around the room. Uh, you know, we, 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 we don't have time to waste here. So um, whatever I can do, uh, I'm eager, you know, for guidance, uh, new tools in the box, as we said, uh, because God knows we need them. But um, I, I, I agree that this is our time now. Uh, the box has been opened, Pandora, and it's ugly. And, and it's hard for people to ignore, even if they don't like you. Uh, so I think we continue to uh, pry open the box and expose the uh, underbelly of the beast. And then people who are of goodwill, and I think most folks are, you know, uh, that we start to reach out and reach out. Thank you. So it's wonderful to see everybody. Thank you so much for including me in this conversation. Right. I think uh, Brother Bill had um, a, a couple of things to say. Bill, Bill, unmute. You're still muted. I think we're winning this struggle. And that's why it's become particularly dangerous because more and more people begin to realize that you can't talk about black liberation without talking about the liberation of oppressed people wherever they might be found. And therefore, this thing is not going to be resolved simply by a discussion. That is, those who are opposed to us, those who are committed to our continued oppression, have no case when the facts are exposed. And so they claim anti-Semitism or they try to destroy organizations, you know, or they try to dominate the media so that the debate never takes place. This means that there are hard times ahead, but it means we're also closer to victory than we might think. 
Okay. I think he has just a sore, um, maybe one minute. I was just going to mention and follow up to Ahmed and others talking about how they've been personally affected. Um, sometimes it's indirect. Uh, Brother Sam Anderson and uh, Brother Bill Sells can attest that um, they used to have an outlet to speak. I used to be part of a show called The Communicators on 90.3 FM where I was a co-host. The main host was a brother named Leroy Baylor, who was a, yeah, a neighbor right. of William Sells and I. And I won't go into the story of the oustering over quote unquote anti-Semitism. People want to know, they can get the Google the Amsterdam News, Leroy Bell, around 2014. I was sort of out on hiatus at that time dealing with my father's issue. But you know, that was a great radio program that we had going on. In fact, Brother Leroy had two programs, the communicators and respect for life. And we would always have um, people on, you know, with these positions. And as I just said, we had uh, Sam Anderson on many times, William Sells. And that format, that outlet was taken away because what really started was a guest named John Kaminsky, who is Jewish, said something against Zionism. And they used that to cancel the show. You know, they moved, they used it. But what led up to this actually was one single woman living in Harlem who was Jewish was writing in to the show each week complaining because Brother Leroy, or he is he is he is Muslim, he's part of the nation of Islam, he considers himself a black culturist, and he would always mention by final call by the Amsterdam News black papers. And she was always writing in to the board at City College, which is where we broadcast out of, et cetera, wanting this, the program canceled because advocating for the, you know, these black formats in the final call was mentioned. But when a Jewish guest who came on mentioned something about Israel, they used that as the premise to remove him off the air. You know, so it just goes to show it doesn't have to be someone from outside of the Jewish community. It could be anybody who voices concern over Zionism and what Zionist uh, policy and what they're doing all. So I, I, I just wanted to mention that. Brother Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you to have the last word. Uh, the last word is the first word of the new level of struggle <laughs> that we all face and must push forward on. Uh, I think this session, um, when our, our young people begin to look at the, the whole session, uh, it, it will be inspirational um, to move on. And I think uh, the session also will inspire uh, questions from those young folk in the Palestinian diaspora and others, black folk in the diaspora and whoever else to give us some questions and comments. I think we look forward to that. I think it's important to see this is not just uh, a mic drop and then we walk away. This is something that uh, we deal with on an ongoing basis uh, as Brother Abdul uh, laid out, you know, we need to build a, a struggle, rebuild a, a, a struggle in, inside of the U.S., to rebuild the Black Liberation Movement, going from just these spontaneous things into something much more uh, organized, institutionalized. And I think that uh, um, what people heard today will be an inspiration to see that happen. Uh, thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart from our students from our communities from everybody who's watching in palestine and elsewhere from all our people on various sides of the struggle but mostly i would say from me my students and our program for all of you to come in and share your knowledge your wisdom your critical understanding and add to so much more in these two hours to what we have known before and expect and to be I, invited, I, again. invited again and and, and I, I say 
Uh, thank you to Sister Rabab for being the political pit bull that she was for the past year around this issue and making it happen. Uh, um, you know, she's she is a, a fighter on uh, uh, um, on all levels, and, and she had to deal with uh, some very serious personal health issues, and at the same time, are dealing with the onslaught at uh, San Francisco State. And uh, I we really appreciate you. Uh, and your work, your labor. Um, like I said, you know, you, you're our Palestinian pit bull, you know, ready to fight at any moment. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. May, may I say uh, something very briefly? Um, someone said on my social media recently, uh, talking to women uh, in particular, that self care is a revolutionary act. And all too often, we who are in the trenches, you know, we, we, that's what we are called to do. We, 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 we rarely think of ourselves, but it's important to think of ourselves so that we can continue the struggle and pass on what we have uh, to the next generation. So self-care is a revolutionary act, and that's for men and women. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm deeply honored.